the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians. We're going to finish this chapter this morning. And the title of the message this morning is To Infiltrate, You Must Associate. To Infiltrate, You Must Associate. When we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, as Christians, the main command that we have, or actually what's referred to commonly as the commission, is to go and to where? All the world. All the world. Right? All the world. So that implies what? Moving forward, moving out, in motion, it's perpetual. Because Jesus didn't put an expiration on that. He says, well, you know, Great Commission, go into the world until you're tired or until it makes no sense to you or until you come across some, you know, difficult people. It's just you go and you make disciples of all, you know, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so that commission that's to us was the same commission that Paul had because he's a follower of Jesus Christ. And that was constantly his heart. His heart was for winning souls. And in and, and this, this letter that was written to the church of Corinth, you know, we established it from the very beginning that he wanted to bring the church back to the centrality of Christ Jesus. In regards to what their issues were, it was always, okay, you may have got this going on in your life, but let's bring it back to what it's all about, the centrality of Jesus Christ. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Christ crucified and even in the even in the areas as we studied last week regarding, you know, whether they were supporting him financially and so on and so forth, and he brings it back and he says, you know what, I'd rather be dead, I'd rather die than to take a penny and impunge my impugn my my reputation, so to speak, in regards to the purpose and my motivation of why I'm sharing what I'm sharing, which is the message or the gospel. And so he establishes those things. And then he parlays it, it begins here in these next verses, you know, uh, 18 through the end to 27, he parlays it into this beautiful imagery and exhortation to the saints in Corinth to get on board with taking the gospel to the ends, to all the world. Because ultimately that's what it's all about for each and every one of us as Christians. If we're not on board with that, then what are we on board with? What, just coming together and, and you know, singing? And if that's the case, then, then yeah, songs, the worship songs are just then just songs with really no power, no meaning. Because what's the point of saying, you know, meet us here, Lord. You know, uh, surround us, empower us, and so on and so forth, if we really don't mean it. If we're really not going to go out into the world and take the gospel, and that being in the forefront of our minds is that, that that's the only, that's the true purpose and the meaning of life is to get to know God before you meet Him face to face and to take that God and share Him with others. Everything else is just the means. It's just the means of how to do that. And Paul knew that. Paul clearly understood the means, you know, the means. Even, even imprisonment. For him, imprisonment was a means to carry the gospel to places that he himself wouldn't, wouldn't think of going on his own, but yet because of the circumstance and his arrest, he's thrown into a dungeon and then gets to preach the gospel to people that were deep down, you know, in some dirty dungeon, along with also two with guards. I mean, you know, most of us wouldn't put that as a priority of where to go, right? To take the gospel. But because God opened those doors, because God allowed, boom, he ends up in a dungeon. And then he writes amazing letters of encouragement from these dark, dark places. And he says, man, great opportunities are opening up. You're in prison. Are you kidding me? You know? And so, exhortation begins to permeate from, from Paul's heart into the letter to the Corinth church. And he writes here in verse 18, and he says, what then is my reward? Because remember, he's talking about financial support or uh, the lack thereof. Now, look, let's get one thing straight. 
It wasn't as though he was lacking finances. Remember, who was the primary supporters of his ministry? The Church of Philippi. They were, they were extremely generous. Extremely generous. But here, in Corinth, for whatever reason, there is, there is the lack thereof. And so he says, so what is my reward? If, if, I'm not fin- if I'm not in this for financial gain, then what is my reward? And he says, that when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. You know, ultimately the gospel message was entrusted to him, and, and the gospel was not his idea. That's basically what he's saying. Preaching the gospel wasn't my idea. So if it wasn't my idea, and I'm just being entrusted with this awesome message, then really, why should I even be thinking about compensation? You know? It's like when someone entrusts you with, with something extremely valuable that they own, whether it's a, you know, a child, whether you may be a, a worldly possession, whatever the case may be. You know, think about it in your own case. You know, whether you've been entrusted or you entrust. You know, if I were to say, hey, look, this is my only grandson. This is our only grandchild. And I'm entrusting you. I'm entrusting you to care for him. You know? I mean, that in and of itself, you know, especially if I'm, you know, uh, or, or better yet, as a parent, if you say, you know, I'm, I'm entrusting my child to you, you know, because I got this terminal disease and uh, there's this entrustment with something that's so precious and valuable, then just the sense of being entrusted is good enough, isn't it? And you're like, wow. You want to turn around and say, oh, man. You're, you're entrusting me with the most precious thing in your life that you consider the greatest, and I'll bill you later. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, what? What's going on here? So that's how he viewed the gospel. The gospel was, was precious to Paul. I mean, this is a man who was filled with rage and hatred in his heart. And, and the Lord himself knocked him off his horse, his high horse, and then, and then it, it eventually opened first his spiritual eyes, even in his physical blindness and then eventually opened his physical eyes and then sent him on a course of ministry to who? To Gentiles, kings, and Jews. Right? Gentiles, kings, and Jews. And so he's like, man, I'm entrusted with this amazing, powerful message of hope, of grace, and really, you're asking, what's my reward? You know? So the idea wasn't his. His reward was experiencing the joy and the privilege of sharing it and seeing people come to faith in Christ. When was the last time you led someone to Christ? Or, better yet, have you ever led someone to Christ? And if you haven't, why not? What's keeping you from leading someone to Christ? What, you know, maybe you've been ministering and ministering and ministering, and you're just too afraid. Maybe it's a fear uh, situation. And you're just too afraid that, you know what, you may lose a relationship. Or you may say the wrong words. Or, but remember, it's not you who converts. It's God Himself who converts. And just uses you as a vessel for the conversion. In case in point, remember when, when Peter was out there preaching. And, and they're, it's you know, going out forth. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of preaching, the Holy Spirit descended. And, and they were converted. The Gentiles were converted. And it was like, they were just but a means, they are just but a vessel. And it was like, like God Himself, you know, and the Holy Spirit says, that's it, that's all we need, and boom, conversion started happening, you know? And they were just amazed, like, and they started, the Gentiles started speaking in tongues, and they're like blown away by it. Don't be afraid. Extend that invitation. Because, you know, you got to reach a point where you sow, you sow, you sow, and then you got to like expect that return, so to speak, on the sowing. And it's as simple in, in most cases as just asking, asking the individual, hey, would you like to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? And you'd be surprised. They may turn around and just say, I've been waiting for you to ask. I've been waiting for that because I don't know how to get there. 
You don't want to load it with all this Bible information and the things about God, but the one thing you never extended was the invitation to receive this God of yours. And so, in, in seeing people come to salvation, Paul was just ecstatic about that. That was, that was his reward to see you know, the non-believer become believers, and in this case, see the Corinth, you know, the people in Corinth come to faith. Corinth, the, the place of, of perversion and idolatry and so on and so forth, and seeing those chains broken, and seeing life come to the dead. The walking dead, you know, as they say, and coming to life. And, and he was like, this is awesome. This is my reward, you know? I, I don't need anything else. And it's just mind-blowing to see someone go from, you know, <clears throat> eternal damnation and separation from God to life right before your very eyes. I remember when we were in a meeting at, at the high school, uh, a young man named Jonathan, you know, uh, I think it was on the first, our first meeting there, and and he stood up, you know, when the invitation was given, he stood up, and we were able to pray for him, and and just, you know, this countenance changing, and so on and so forth, and and it was powerful. It was, it's powerful. It's seeing people come to the knowledge of salvation. Guess what? Never gets old. It never gets old. That's why you see ministries like. You know, harvest. And people always in the end. And, and it's the tricky part is this, is that as Christians, when you go to these outreaches, you know what's coming. Right? You know what's coming. And and generally like, you know, especially in this in this day and age with people who like, you know, you start talking about certain movies and new releases and people, oh, don't spoil it for me, man. You know? No, don't spoil it. I haven't seen it yet. It's like, alright, get weird about it. Okay, whatever, you know, that's your thing. You know, you can tell me about me, but I I still either I'm gonna go see it or I'm not gonna go see it makes no diff to me. But as Christians, we go to these outreaches. Spoiler alert, you know what's coming. <laughs> you know, in, in difference of like, in, in comparison to, to, you know, spoiling a movie, now sometimes you go like, oh, I don't even want to watch that anymore. But with outreaches, you're like, man, you get more fired up as you know you're coming to that point when what? When the invitation goes forth. And you're like, man, we're here. And especially if you took a non-believer and you start praying, get, Lord, get them out of their seat. Get them out of their seat. And then you see some that then reach out to that individual and just lean over lovingly and say, would you like me to go with you? Because sometimes that's what it takes, right? And they reach out and and then they make the march. And it's awesome. You're like, this is cool. This is powerful. This is amazing. You know, heaven's going to be off the hook. And so Paul was entrusted with the, the, the message that brought forth that fruit. Entrusted to him. That's good enough for me. And he says in, in verse 19... After establishing that, the, the power behind it had the great reward of it. And he says, What then is my what then is my reward? I mean, sorry, verse 19. For for though I am free from all men. Emphasis on this, okay? And what do we have in Christ Jesus? Liberty. We don't want to owe you don't want to be in debt to anybody. You know? But yet, unfortunately. The ways of the world, that's how it is. And, and what happens? Especially if you start going in a different direction. It gets hung over your head. It's like, hey, don't forget, you owe me. You know? You owe me. But Paul says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. He wanted what? Increase. Increase. He wanted what Christ wants. Increase. To see the kingdom further. 
When you're under no obligation to anyone, you experience greater liberty to serve everyone. Think about that. Because even, even, even within the fellowship, listen, if all of a sudden you feel that you're indebted to me for, one, for some way, shape, or form as a pastor, uh, it's going to inhibit your service to the Lord. The, the only one I'm, I'm indebted to is, is to Christ. It's to my Savior. That's, that's, he's the only one. Now, I may serve in certain capacities, and I may show loyalty, and so on and so forth, but look, at any given moment, if, if, if all of a sudden there's a call, or whatever the case may be, you know, you need to be obedient to the Lord. To the Lord. Not to your feelings, not to obligation to man, not because of, you know, this, that, the other, to the Lord and to the Lord alone, and obey. Obey. But Paul's talking about here about the liberty and the flexibility he has to minister, to minister to a greater audience. To a greater audience. And this is the core, this is the core of the heart of Christ, right? This is the core of the, at the heart of Christ. Christ came and he sought what? The loss. The loss. You know? Uh, when you look at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 11, he got a lot of flack for that from the Pharisees, especially the religious type. The religious, when you look at Jesus in contrast to the Pharisees, they're, they're polar opposite. Polar opposite, man. You know, the Pharisees were all, you know, haughty, filled with, them, filled with themselves, prideful, so on and so forth. And, and they look down on people. They constantly look down on people. And they had all these, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're uh, legalistic in, in their mindset, but yet they themselves fell very short as far as, you know, maintaining the law 100%. And yet, when, that, when those things would occur, they would make modifications for themselves. Some tweaks here and there. So they would maintain that, that aura or the appearance that, you know what, they're so holy. That was the Pharisees. And they would never roll with sinners. And who they consider sinners? Well, basically anyone probably outside of their own circle. You know? <laughs> who are the sinners? They are. Not us. We're, we're the religious leaders. How can we possibly be sinners? In contrast to Christ, Christ says, I came to serve and not to be served. I came to roll with the sinners. You know? I, I came to be amongst the people. I came to be among the sick, the downtrodden. I came to sit at a well with, with a Samaritan woman. I came to, to rescue a prostitute. You know? And to spend time. And then, and then not only spend time, but bring them into the fold of ministry. I mean... Polar opposite. It's interesting. I actually have, uh, you know, after after 9-11, I actually was uh, curious. I, I, did, I didn't do exegesis and shame on me. I actually did the opposite, through the opposite term is, but instead of letting the Bible read out, I started kind of trying to find and fit certain things in the Bible, and one of them was 9-11. And so I started searching the scriptures regarding, you know, well, verses that were like 9-11 to see what they said. But interestingly enough, when I was uh, finishing up this message and searching for different verses, Matthew 9-11 to me is a great warning, right? You know? And it's like, it's interesting because in, in Matthew 9-11, he says this, They mock him, referring to Jesus. And it says, And the Pharisees saw this. They said to his disciples, Who is your teacher? Oh, sorry. Why is your teacher eating with the tax gatherers and sinners? You know? So it's like, like, warning, warning, why, why? You know, 9-11 is all about the warning, right? 9-11, you call when there's an emergency, and there's a warning. This is the Pharisees giving a warning to his disciples, basically trying to pull, 
pull the disciples away from this Jesus because they see him gaining what? Power. They see him gain that power. And they didn't want to lose that power as they saw more and more people, you know, the common folk following Jesus. And yet, but when he heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. And because of my eyes, I actually can't even read the rest. It says, uh, I, de- I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but who? Sinners. And you know that was a near shot, obviously, of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are like, oh, what are you implying? Hmm. Interesting, right? And then in Luke 19, and in verse 10, Jesus again says that He came to, to seek the lost. And then in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, He, he said that He came to call, to call sinners. And He calls us, how? By name. And then in Luke 15, 7, He takes it a step further, and He says that, The heavens and the angels, there's a party, and the heavens and the angels rejoice when what happens? When a sinner comes to what? Repentance. And yet, again, when you're talking about the contrast between Pharisees and Jesus, Pharisees, if they had their way, sinners wouldn't be in heaven. You know? It's just their clique would be in heaven. And yet, the heart of Christ is the very heart of Paul. Perfectly lined up. Now, the question that must be posed is this: Is that because this is a complete when you're you're talking about when you're talking about um, ministry, Jesus Jesus leaves the comfort of heaven, right? He's God, and the Bible tells us that he he emptied himself, not of deity, but of position, so to speak. Because he came and he wrapped himself in flesh and he stooped and became a man. The kenosis. The emptying out. And so by doing so, he came to what? To infiltrate. He came to infiltrate. To, to work, work his way in. You know? Weave his way in. And to what? And to the lives of people. Infiltration. Remember... The, the, the Pharisees, I'm sorry, the disciples were blown away when they came back. You know, they went to go get some food, and, and then when they're going through Samaria, and, uh, you know, obviously a place that most Jews went around, they wouldn't have anything to do with those half-Jews, wannabe Jews. They looked down at them. So even, even like, you know, it's kind of funny because the people, none of us are, are, are free from, you know, uh, from having an attitude of looking down at people. <clears throat> because we all do it. And Pharisees look down on the sinners, and they're referring to the people, the Jews. And yet, the Jews look down on who? Samaritans. The Samaritans. And so, in Jesus saying, hey, you know, I came for those that are sick, and so on and so forth, those in Jesus' account could be saying, yeah. But then all of a sudden, you know, they like, take that, Pharisees. But then, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Because then, okay, here comes his disciples back after trying to get some food, you know, because they're hungry, and all of a sudden they see Jesus eating with the Samaritan woman. I mean, uh, speaking with the Samaritan woman. And they're all like, what's he doing with her? <laughs> what are you guys doing? The very thing that you just said to the Pharisees, ha, 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 you know, and you're looking down at the Samaritan woman. And so, in a sense, we're all, we're all very guilty of doing that. What Jesus desires us to do is to see us all the same. Sinners. Sinners. In desperate need of salvation. In desperate need of a Savior. Level playing field, so to speak. No one's better than anybody else just because of titles and all that stuff or financial means. That, that has, God doesn't look at that. He looks at the heart. And so... How can you infiltrate if you do not associate 
You can't infiltrate if you don't associate. You know? How can you, how can you rescue someone if you are not willing to go to where they need rescue from? Imagine, you know, as a matter of fact, this actually happened on, like early on in some of my uh, ride-alongs. There's a, there's, a, there's a 904 going on. And so we went, we arrived. We actually got there first. We arrived first before fire, right? And uh, so as, um, as we're standing there, uh, the apartment buildings, uh, the second floor is on fire, you know? And I see the smoke coming out. And, and there's, there's uh, obviously people have already exited. Well, it turns out to be that there's a question whether there's still someone inside and we found out that there actually was and so I'm standing going like I'm the first to hear this and I'm going like you know what, what do you do what do you do but it wasn't you know and it was one of those moments that were literally like like oh my gosh like this is it you know it's like gotta go in I mean there's a human being in that needs rescuing but by the grace of God as I'm starting to like build up the courage because you know I, look, that's no easy task, man. That is no te- easy task to run to danger. And think about it. Jesus, that's exactly what he did. No hesitation. But I'm standing there going like, I, I, gotta, I gotta build the courage to do this, you know? And right when I start kind of like, all right, I'm good, let's, let's do this. Fire rolls up. You know, I'm like, okay, let's be wise, you know? Let's be wise. And, and sure enough, there's a, a, a well, animal and a human that were still there. And, and the, the human being went back to rescue the animal. Mm. Right, you know? But you can't rescue someone from afar. You, you can't see someone drowning and, and see the, you know, the life jacket and say, I'll save you! The life jacket is right there! You know? It's like, no, you got to throw them the life jacket. You might have to jump in there and get them. You, know? you have to be willing to go, to go, to go, to rescue. You know, what did Jesus say about the gates of hell? Shall not prevail, right? And, and, and what are we supposed to do? Charge them. Charge them. Think about this. <coughs> Jesus entered into the most hostile, the most possible hostile environment that he could have entered. Where's that? Earth. <coughs> he, he, he entered the most hostile place or environment, not just, you know, geographically, but we're talking... In the universe. And the universe, as we know, is what? Vast and eternal. Think about the magnitude behind that. That of the entire universe, this place called Earth is the most hostile place that it could possibly have gone. Not, not you know, uh, Mars or Pluto or any other star, whatever the case may be, but planet Earth. Why? Because, because man... Hates light. That's right. Man hates light. That's right. Yeah. And yet, he entered. He came. To a hostile environment. To a hostile place. Why? To infiltrate and to associate. To infiltrate and to associate. Through baptism, what what happens? We become connected through sin. That's why Jesus, not that he needed baptism, he was no sinner, but to identify through association, through baptism. John says, you know, his cousin, hey, I'm not baptizing you. I'm not even worthy to touch your chakras. <laughs> you know, much less baptize you. And Jesus says, oh, no, 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 no. In fulfillment of scriptures, dunk away. And it's through that dunking that Jesus associated and infiltration. Infiltration association. There's a song that's called, what? Jesus, Friend of Sinners, right? 
And he even told the disciples, and he tells us, he said, listen, you're more than, you're, you're not slaves. Slaves don't know the business of the master. You know the biz. You know the ins and the outs. You're, you're not slaves. You're friends. But he took it a step further, and eventually said, you know, but if you're going to be a friend, then you'll do what I command. <laughs> that comes with the territory, you know? But again, it's, he infiltrated, he associated, and he had great success in administering miracles, feeding, the word, teaching about the kingdom, so on and so forth. In the same manner, Paul, learning from the best, had that same mind that was found in who? In Christ Jesus. You see, when you start when you start breaking down the scriptures, you start having aha moments. It's like, oh, aha, well, no wonder he wrote that. You know? Yeah, have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. You know? And again, go, again, go back to Philippians. It says, though he was God, so equal to God, and yet he humbled himself, became a man. And, and, and we know that in the Gospel of John, the Gospel says that the Word became what? Became flesh and he dwelt amongst us and we beheld his glory but the mind the mind the mind so have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus Paul says and he exhorts us and so we have that same mindset of salvation salvation infiltration association you know rolling hanging out with sinners loving on them so on and so forth and having that same mind what's Paul do when he comes to the Grecian uh, I mean to the um, well, yeah, the Grecian area there in uh, uh by Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. It seeks the opportunity, right? Acts chapter 17 is, is all about that mindset that was in Christ. The same mind that was in Christ. Paul could have easily said, hey, you know what? These, these philosophers, they're way off. And this is idolatry to the bone. <laughs> you know? I'm going in the complete opposite direction. Instead, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through wisdom, he, he saw the opportunity. Even though, even though those Epicurean, you know, and the uh, what was the other group, the Epicurean and um, Stoics. the Stoic, Stoics, and Epicurean, they considered him an a, an idle babbler. <laughs> like, who is this babbler? You know, blah 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 blah. Because when he was teaching, they saw it. They heard it as just like babble. It's like it's foolishness, it's stupidity. But yet, they still invited him. They said, all right, we'll give you a crack. Go for it, take your shot. And, and he went for it. Now, if your ego and your pride and all that, if that's where you find your identity, the moment someone calls you an idle babbler, I don't think you're going to be sharing anything. You're going to be like, oh, you think I'm an idle babbler? Get you then, yeah? yeah. You know? You, you, don't even, you don't even know me. <laughs> you don't even know where I come from. You don't even know what I learned. And all of a sudden, she starts throwing it down. You know, like, that's not, that's not the mind of Christ. I mean, if they really want to go there, the Pharisees told Jesus, you're, you're the devil. <laughs> Hello? You're the devil. And Jesus said, that's it. I'm out. I'm going back to heaven. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, look at verse, uh, look at verse twenty. In verse twenty, he says, "And to the Jews." And this is man. He's like, oh, I'm telling you. Well, Paul's writing this. I could just imagine you know, when he's sitting there writing. He's like, "Oh man, I'm on fuego." This is good stuff. Yes, Lord, keep it coming. Holy Spirit, yes. You know? He says to the Jews, because it's, it, it's in reflection, right? To the Jews, to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the, the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, you know? So it's like, what's that telling you? It's like, was, was he deceiving us? No, he was just identifying. That's it. Mm. Just because, you know, it's the old, like, um, I love you. I may love you, 
But I don't necessarily have to agree with you. It's not, it's not exclusive. You know, you, to love someone doesn't mean that you have to completely agree with everything that they do or everything that they believe. And so, <clears throat> under the law, uh, that, I, that I might win those who are under the law, to those who are without law as without law. And all this is backed up because remember when uh, Peter played the game of like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to eat kosher food. And, and, and uh, Paul's like, ah, 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 Paul, Peter, I saw you. You were, you know, when you weren't around the other Jews, you were eating, you know, I saw you. A little porky porky there and all the other stuff, you know. I saw you. Catfish, you know, <laughs> shrimp. Come on, Peter, you know. And then, and then when it came time to the, you know, when they start, when the Gentiles start uh, coming to Christ and, and, and uh, the news got back to the Jewish believers, they're like, this can't be. And it's like, well, it's happening, you know? Well, you're going to go, you're going to go against what God's doing? <laughs> I don't know. You could try, I guess, you know? And so they say, okay, fine, 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 fine. Well, uh, it's all good what's happening, but uh, we'll put two things on them. You know, first they want to put the entire law, and then the the Jews were like, "We don't need to do it. <laughs> we don't need to keep the law." You know, that law's tough. Yeah. That's a tough gate there, man. So how can we put that on them? That that which we don't do ourselves. Like, okay, okay, okay. I mean, I'm telling you, that meeting must have been just like at times comical. You know, it's it, it's it, at times it's comical. And we experience that. We experience that. I mean, look, that's not to say, because this is, this is what happens sometimes, especially as parents. When, when kids start doing that, when your kids start throwing your past in your face, well, you, well, that, Dad, I was at your wedding. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what's the big deal that I'm, you know, living with my boyfriend or this, that, or the other? You know? As though now, as though the word no longer is true. And some parents cave. And they turn around like, ah, you, you, you got me, you know? You got me, you're right, okay, well, um, guess go live with your boyfriend, you know? I'm like, what? No, the truth is, is that when you were there at the wedding, it was sin back then too. <laughs> you know? It wasn't right back then and it isn't right now. And yet, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, He worked those things together for good. But it was never good. It was never right. It was never righteous. It was never not sin. And I'm here, son, daughter, you know, to teach you and to share with you this truth and in hopes that you would learn from your parents mistakes and not repeat them and desire instead to live in righteousness in his holiness you know and so he continues to say though not being without the law of God but under the law of Christ that I might win those who are without the law to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I may by all means save some. So in essence, his aim was to reach a wide range of people. Because when you look at this list, it, you know, it's not... It's not uh, the end all of list, but it's it, it, it's pretty wide range, and so his point isn't just exclude or just the Jews, just the unlawed. No, he's just basically saying, listen, everybody, like why would we limit? Why would we limit? Why would we put limits on God on who to reach and how to reach them? That's not our responsibility. That, that that's not that's not our call. The Bible makes it clear that the, that the Lord desires that all would come to, to the knowledge of salvation. And all is all. So His aim to reach 
His aim was to reach a wide range of people from every walk of life. Religious, non-religious, meticulous. You know, those that are, you know, and I'm taking this from from, uh, the message translation, loose living. You know, the defeated, the demoralized. And the list goes on and on and on. It's like, again, unlimited, unlimited. Not with a ceiling. And not, not by my estimation of who should be saved. Or, or the type of person. Now, here's where it's critical. Because he makes it very clear that association does not mean assimilation. Association does not mean assimilation. This is, there's a huge difference. He never took on their way of life or their way of thinking, but entered their world to try and experience things from their point of view. That's it. I'm just trying to understand you, man. That's it. That's all I'm trying to do. That is so critical when you're talking about ministry. You know, I, I shared several weeks ago regarding like how's God worked that out regarding like when people get saved in in in, in challenging situations that may perhaps like they may be in in, in an industry that isn't godly. And yet, you know, their whole financial household depends on that income. What do you do? What do you do? I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I've never been in that situation. I mean, in some way, shape, or form, we all work in places that are corrupt, you know? I mean, uh, unless you're full-time ministry, but even in the church, you know? The devil rolls in the church, okay? And, and so, no one's immune from corruption, but I'm talking about, you know, in generally speaking, you know, uh, your, your, as they say, secular businesses, hey, they're, they're welcome into everyone, every mindset, and some businesses donate to weird organizations that are ungodly. And, you know, I talked about that thing last week that, you know what, God bless those people who like to, you know, um, uh, boycott. I, I just can't get into that. I, I, I might, I'm under the belief that, you know what, if you really want to make an impact as a Christian, live the Christian lifestyle. That would be a greater impact. Stop with the divorce. Let's start there. Let's dump that number back down to, you know, aim towards zero divorce rate. You know, I get it. There's going to be circumstances that, you know what, I'd never tell a, a, a wife, or even nowadays, I've seen it, where the husband's getting the beat down, you know? It's like, yeah, dude, you're getting beat down. Get out! You know? But he, he just, he, I would never do that. But I'm talking the, I just don't love anymore, or it's just not working out, or it's all this other stuff. It's like, well then, you know what, love your spouse, as, as Jesus says, you know, uh, as a stranger. Love, love, your, love your enemy. Love them as an enemy, you know. There's, there's, no, there's no real reason why you shouldn't love your spouse, because there's no out. There's biblical, you know, uh, commands that the Lord gives us to love no matter what. <laughs> but, but like I said, for me, the whole boycotting and stuff like that, no, if we as Christians, as the Bible says, if we would, if we would turn from our wicked ways, if we would turn from our wicked ways, then the Lord would heal the land. Because then there would be obvious difference that is tangible and visible to the world that says, Wow, the stuff that happens to us doesn't happen in the Christian circles. In the sense of the, you know, the corruption and so on and so forth and, and how you deal with those things. But yet, that line of the difference between the world and the church is so blurred now. And that's why we're left with, let's boycott, you know? <laughs> let's boycott, you know? Don't buy this, don't buy that. But the point is, is that in some sense, we all work in an environment that is extremely sinful. And that is anti-Christ. But most of us, if not all of us, don't work in an environment where, where it is blatant anti-Christ. And yet, what do you do? What do you do? I, I'd say, I prefer that individual right here. 
You read and meditate what Paul wrote out. Because ultimately, that's going to be between you and God what you end up doing. But know this. The emphasis is non-participation. Non-participation. Association, again, doesn't mean I'm participating. I could roll with you and not do what you do. Okay? I, got, I, I have friends that are non-believers, and I roll with them. But if they start saying, hey, let's go do this, or let's go do that, and it's not according to the Word of God, that's where I tap out and say, hey, no thanks. Uh, I'm, not at that, I'm not at that persuasion or that mindset, you know? I appreciate the invitation, nonetheless, but I don't go that way. But I associate. I get to know them. Because, because how do you minister to someone if you don't know them, you know? So he didn't, he didn't assimilate. He never took on their way of life, but like I said, but entered their world to try and experience things from their point of view. Why are you so angry? Why, you know, why, why do you think that you know, uh, stripping is a good idea? Well, how'd you end up there? You know? I mean, uh, and the drugs, how'd you end up in drugs? Uh, yeah, I do my best sometimes, depending on, on the traffic light, right? Because uh, um, generally, coming off the freeway, especially there on Clark by the house, there's a this is there's a group that that takes turns as far as standing there and asking for for funds, you know. And I, I do my best to just okay. When I'm stopped, if I have extra food or I'm led, they you know, bless them with you know, financially. Whatever the case may be, when I roll down the window, because they come, and the light just turned red, I say, quick, read your digest version. How'd you end up here? And how long have you been out here? You know? And, and they'll say, you know, like Cecil, bless his heart, just an, an older, older gentleman who just, you know, things fell apart in his life, and he ended up homeless, and he says, I don't do drugs and all those things. And he's got to be, he's probably in his mid-60s. But again, being out on the streets ages you that much more, so I don't know, it's hard to tell. But sweet, sweet gentleman, Cecil, and, and it's just, he's so, you give him food, and man, he gets so excited, and his God bless you's are genuine, Jesus loves you, you know? And, and But it's a quick, you know, read the guy's version, why? Because life's going to turn green. I said, I don't have that much time. But you know, I'll meet people like that, and I'll like, hey, readers, digest version, quick, go, how'd you end up like this? Or why are you doing the things that you go? You know, because I, I'm looking to make a, a, you know, even if it's a quasi connection, so that stays in my heart. So when I pray, or if God leaves to take it a step further and do, there's a connection, not just like you know, standoffish and like, oh, hey, I'll help, but just from a distance. You know, how can you minister to someone? who is hostile to the gospel if you don't know why they are hostile to the gospel. Our, our tendency is that when we find someone who is hostile towards the gospel, we want to argue with them. And we want to prove them wrong where the case may be. Instead of inquiring. That's a heart and heart towards the love of God. Why? What, what happened? Was it, was it because, was it at the hands of another Christian? You know, we all have, you know, s social media. Um, most of us have social media accounts, and we see the stuff that goes on out there. And, and I have one particular social media friend who was dropped hard by the spouse. So I'm talking hard. And she lights up social media with some pretty nasty stuff. And it's so easy for me just to go, unfriend. Right? That'd be the easy thing. Unfriend. So, oh man, I, I don't want to read those things. And, oh, I don't want to see that. I want to hear them. Cause, because her hostility has become somewhat towards the church. Not somewhat. A lot. <laughs> I'm talking straight up. You know? Pointing out the hypocrisy within the church. That you know what? Hey holy, holy over here, but you know what? When someone's in desperate need and because they've made poor decisions, how the church turns their back on individuals and drops them hard, 
or sides with the wrong individual, doesn't bother to go find out the truth and what's going on, and just makes judgments from afar, and because of position or whatever the case may be, you know, all of a sudden the individual that was truly wounded is left hanging dry. And they can't disassociate God Himself who loves and is faithful and, and, and always compassionate, long-suffering from the body of Christ who inflicted the pain. Try that. You know? And yet, again, like I said, it'd be easier just to go, <laughs> I'm friend. Then to just hang in there and pray, Lord, send someone her way, Lord God. And would just reach her and just, just love on her. Because that's not who you are. That she'd get her eyes back on you. Your, your love is everlasting. You are compassionate. But you can't find out if you don't, if you don't, you know, associate. If you're not willing to infiltrate. You know, or how can you minister to the broken if you don't know what broke them? Like, oh, don't go near them. They're so bitter. They're <laughs> always bitter, man. They're always bitter. Everything's negative. Everything that comes out of their mouth is negative. They're so angry all the time. I don't... I, I get excited about people like that. Because again, that's, you know, I mean, how awesome would it see for a person like that to be turned around by the love of Christ? But yet again, it's just easier to what? Woo! Oh, stay away, you know? Recently, and some of you are familiar with his uh, ministry, and look, by no way, by any stretch of imagination, am I advocating for, for this if this is not God calling you to do it. But think about this. On any given Sunday, at any church, the people that are there are there. Why? Because they've chosen to go. It's real simple. Well, unless they're kids, you know, they, you know I'm talking adult-wise. Free, free-willed adults are there as a choice. You know? Uh, they may be going to church out of habit, but nonetheless... You know, generally speaking, adults are there out of choice. Now, uh, throughout the United States of America, I don't know how many churches there are, but there's hundreds of thousands. Your your average your average size church, they say, is is like like a hundred. The the uh, anomaly of mega churches is just that's an anomaly, you know, which is obviously, you know, by the hand of God, and it is a God thing, but. Throughout the United States, there's not a whole bunch of 5,000 and up churches. There's generally, you know, 100 and down. You know? That's it. That's, 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 that's a church. But on any given Sunday, even with hundreds of thousands of churches throughout the United States of America, how many people don't go to church? There's a lot more, right? How many of those, no matter how much you invite them, won't go, no matter what? or can't go, or feel that they are ashamed to go. The numbers are exuberant. They're in the millions, right? And yet, it goes back to the word. How will they know? How will they hear? You know, if, if, if the happy feet don't take it, how will they hear the good news? How will they be saved? They, they can't. They can't. And so that's where the church comes in. That's where the living, breathing body of Christ comes in and goes to the highways and byways to the places that and for the religious would make them horrified and cringe. Case in point, I just recently read, you know, I'm a, I, I follow, uh, some of you may know him, but Victor Marx. Yeah. Victor Marx, that dude's radical. He's a radical Christian. Goes to war-torn countries. He, he snags children you know, and, and, and rescues them from firefights and stuff like that. Uh, he goes to, to, the, to the fringe people, the, the people on the fringe, which, by the way, look, when the church doesn't go out, the fringe gets closer to the church. Yeah. Okay? Right. right? And when I'm talking about those things that are outside the norm of, of uh, society, 
creep in as normal. Okay? Without Christ, then it becomes more normal, even to the church, where we become those that just accept and do nothing. Case in point, like uh, same-sex marriage. How many in the church? And I'd say, eh, because the friend just crept in, right? As opposed to the church going out and addressing those things, taking Christ, taking the purity and what, what marriage is all about, and that born-again experience, and then, right, there's the decrease of that and, and the greater understanding of God's truth and the purpose behind marriage and so on and so forth. But anyways, so back to uh, um, Victor Marx. They recently went, him and his wife, to an adult entertainment expo. <clears throat> do you think those people are going to church? And how do you reach them? <clears throat> By going. Again, I'm not advocating this for any stretch of the imagination. I'm just using it as an example. Even for some of you right now, going, like, oh, that's pretty hardcore. It is. But yet, as Christians, some may be called to that. And obviously, him and his wife were. And they set up a booth, and they handed out tracts, and they prayed for people, and they have video of people coming up and asking questions, and he shared the ministry, he shared the power of Christ, mm -hmm. and he sowed seeds, and he sowed seeds, and he sowed seeds. It's powerful, you know? I mean, I, I know I'm not called to that, so I wouldn't venture to go there, you know? Or, or you know, you take, and, and, and you know, the church, the church as a whole, there may be some, like I said, that are sitting on, on holy thrones and then frowning on that going like, that's not of God. Do you know how many times the church said that's not of God? <laughs> About the history? You know, that goes all the way back to the days of Jesus. You know, when Jesus was walking this earth, how many times did the Pharisees say, that's not of God? And then, who was it? It was uh, Nicodemus. He says, well, if it isn't, it'll be squashed. But if it is, hmm, you're not stopping it. No one is. Simple as that. So, the history of the church, of believers, it's there. That's not of God. That's not of God. The Jesus movement, that's not of God. You know? Uh, uh, bringing instruments to the church, whether it's electric guitars, drums, and so on and so forth. That's not of God. That's, that's not of God. That's not of God. That, who, you know, when did you, when did you get elected King of Kings and Lord of Lords? <laughs> going, to, going to adult entertainment for Expo and setting up a booth there and giving them the love of Christ and handing out tracts and loving them. That's not a God. I mean, that's like, that's an oxymoron. And so, Paul, if you really think about it, Paul went to a place like it was like an adult expo. I mean, in Corinth, there was open sex going on, open perversion going on. And Paul could have easily said, oh, that's not, that's the, uh, there's no way, I'm too holy for that. And yet he says, you know what? Why? Why is this going on? What? Why can't they see the love of God that, you know what, God intended greater things for them? And he began to know them and love on them, associate and make headway. And the conversion started happening. Same thing with, with uh, you know, people say, God approves of slavery. No, he doesn't. But through the gospel, hearts were changed. Hearts were changed. And it's, it's, a, it's a fact that, that slavery went downward when the gospel went upward into the hearts of man. No difference in our country or in Europe and in, in, in England, you know? Amazing Grace, you know? Uh, and and uh, uh, that was the name of the movie, right? The yeah. movie Amazing Grace? Yeah. William Waterford. Yeah, and his heart was for the Lord and just said, according to the Bible, this isn't right. And he stood in righteousness and he still associated and went to the government leadership and so on. He could have said, oh, you guys are fourth, that's it. I'm going the opposite direction. He says, no. I associate, but I'm not assimilating to that mindset. That's wrong. And the Lord used him to make headway. Slowly but surely, chipping away. Slow. And again, in our country, it's like, hey, man, 
These are human beings. It's not right. It's not right. Hebrews 4.14. What's it say about Jesus himself? He's the great sympathizer. He's the friend, again, of the sinner. He went to, to uh, Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus was fired up about Jesus. Jesus is coming. Jesus runs up the tree because he couldn't see. And then Jesus is like, oh, Zacchaeus, come in. As a matter of fact, your house. Coming. I'm coming to your house, man. Like, whoa, what happens to Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, he was a crook. I think he was a crook. And in that visitation of Jesus, Jesus going into his house, into the house of a sinner, a tax collector, not only did he make things right, but he went over and above, you know, you could say the tithe and the offering, you know, out of the joy, out of, out of just the overflow of the visitation from the Savior. It's impossible to minister to the lost if we keep them at bay. How can we, the ex-lepers, want to keep, you know, the, the sinner at bay? Isn't that hypocritical? Yeah. Now again, Paul in no way, shape, or form is saying with compromise of your faith, with compromise of the truth. And absolutely not. There is a way to go about ministering to the lost without forfeiting, without compromise. And that's where wisdom and discernment come in. Wisdom and discernment. Look at verse 23. He says, this is the wisdom and discernment, and I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. I don't want to be a participant, but I do it through the lens of the gospel. You know, the centrality, the centrality of his motivation, purpose, foundation, his aim and joy was the gospel. Christ Jesus, Christ crucified. What kept him moving forward, and, de- and this was what, what kept him moving forward and determined. This is what kept him, or kept his bearings. Christ, 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 his holiness, his righteousness. So in those times of associating with the ungodly, Christ, was the centrality of his bearings and, and his desire. I don't want to be like you, you know, the loss. That's where I came from. I want, to, I want to see you set free. As a carrier of the gospel, I need to maintain my steadfastness in that and not, and not forfeit that. And since he was under no obligation to no, no man, he was at liberty to go to these places and to these people and take... Christ crucified to them and stood firmly in that. Stood firm because he understood the power. And then finishing off in verse 24 it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? And so he, here comes the kind of like the, the coup de grace, the, the encouragement to the, to the church, you know? It's like, how do, how do I do this? You know, how do I keep it up? Well, I'm going to give you the secret, you know? It's like not all that run... Uh, in the race, <clears throat> I'm sorry, do you not know that those who run in the race <clears throat> all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. That you may win. You know, this whole now participation stuff, no. that's nonsense. It's not even biblical. Look, I'm not talking about ridiculing losers, you know? <laughs> You're like, ah, you lost. No, no but you... you you recognize those that put forth effort, worked hard, were diligent, and, and, and played the win. And then the results are they won, and you recognize them. Hello, today's uh, Super Bowl, right? Yeah. right. Eagles. You know, could you imagine at the end of the Super Bowl, you know, the hard fought, the team that practiced harder had the better plays, and at the end they say, oh, okay, we got a trophy, but we're not going to give it to you. Instead, we're going to give medals to both teams. Mm. Everyone go nuts. Like, what? That's ridiculous. You know? It's just biblical. It's biblical. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Then, I'm mean, sorry, they then do it to receive a, a perishable wreath. But, but, but we, an imperishable. And Paul's pulling from, basically it was kind of like the, uh, the equivalent of the Olympics that was occurring there. 
Um, it happened every two years, and, and the folks would see the, the competitors, generally uh, wrestlers and stuff like that, um, come in a year before in preparation. And it was a year of preparation. They would eat, breathe, live, think, the, the, the match, the, you know, their, their, their discipline. That's what their focus was. No distraction, that's it, you know. The difference between a pro and an amateur is like night and day. <laughs> You know, us weekend warriors and whatever it is that you do, whether it's like tennis, basketball, you know, whatever sport you may be in or, or discipline you may be into, and you, you, you think that, yo, I'm doing it three times a week and, you know, I'm on this diet and that. It's like, dude, and do that. You're not even close to what pros are, okay? That's, that's a profession. They're, they're like machines, okay? And they're literally, they got people that are, that are just tinkering with that machine. To begin with, I mean, like even their heart rate, their heart rate, like an average heart rate when you're standing still for the average person is probably like 73 beats per second. A, a pro is like down in like in the 40s, man. In some cases, they're like just one beat. <laughs> Boom. Boom. You know, it's like, cool, got under control. Why? Because when the competition comes, they got to keep that heartbeat down because if not, they start getting cramps you need more uh, uh, fuel and so on and so forth. And for the amateur, that's why we tap out so soon. But the pro, they go on and on and on, right? And so Paul's saying, you got to train that way. you got to have that discipline. Verse 26, therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. There's purpose behind what he's doing. I box in such a way as not beating the air, and he's not referring to shot at boxing, he's referring to making sure that when I do swing, I connect. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hit, okay? But I buffet my body and make it my slave, less possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. And he's talking about here about rewards, not salvation, losing salvation. So, you know, if I were just to read this, and I were to sum it up, I'd say, you know what, why did Paul just teach us here? It's all about winning! <laughs> it's all about winning! Winning what, though? Winning souls. It's winning souls. Proverbs 11, 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. There's no quit in Christ. There's no quit in Christ. When you're in Christ Jesus... And truly in Christ, and He's in you, you're going to find yourself, like Paul says, I'm under obligation. I, even if I want to stop, I can't stop. It's just, it, it's, it's impossible. There's no quit in Christ. We keep on, we keep on keeping on, relentlessly, tenaciously committed, in discipline, and single-minded, single focus, no excuses, shutting out distractions, looking past the shortcomings, digging in deep into our faith, knowing Jesus Christ goes before us, and in Him and for Him, all things are working together for good. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this blessed morning, Lord Jesus, that these, this letter, Lord God, this section that Paul writes, Lord God, is so powerful, Lord Jesus. You know, there's so many out there that are lost, Lord God, that, are, as you said in your words, Jesus, are needing of a physician. You came for those that are sick. And, the, and they're everywhere. And they're, the vast majority of them are coming to church. That's why we need to go. And that's why we have the blessing of, of you, Holy Spirit, speaking to hearts and, and it's ministries birthing that are outside of, of what the church may feel that is, that is acceptable. Because you love everyone, Lord God. You desire that none would perish, but all would come to the knowledge of salvation. And I pray that, Lord God, that we would be radical in our faith. Just like you, Jesus. You know, it, it, just like in the days that you walked this earth, Lord God, you were considered a, a heretic. A heretic. And yet... Here we are over 2,000 years later, and in some cases, depending on certain ministries, 
certain church leaders believe that it's it's anti-Christ and in certain extents and in forms of certain ministries but who are we to determine what we look for is fruit is there fruit because ultimately Lord God you know our heart if we're doing things for the wrong reason then we could expect bad fruit it'll be evident but if we're in for the right reasons because you've called us because you're leading us because we're we're tenacious about wanting to see souls come to the knowledge of salvation because we we have your love at the forefront of our mind and our hearts Lord God all those things that align with your word then there will be good fruit and no matter what people may other people may say about certain ministries or what we're doing you know you'll bless it you'll increase it and so we thank you Lord God we thank you for Paul's radical heart that is in line with your heart to be all things to all men but not compromising his convictions in you Lord Jesus to know that ultimately he carried the solution to heart problems in the form of the gospel. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.